So um, we are the first people to unleash the storytelling power of theater to lawyers. This is still one of my favorite cartoons. Don't you love this? Uh, and, oop, this is not going. So I'm just going to put this away. Oh, it's emotional truth to witnesses. So, you know what? Is it a distance thing? I don't Let's know see. what it is. Let me see if we're on. You know what we're going to do? We're just going to wing it. I think we're going to get rid It'll of this. It'll work out. Oh, there we go. A, oh, I got thank it. you. You want me to click it? Or do you want to take, take to the right a little? I'll take it to the right a little and see. Does it like this better? So this is the book, which is the book, because I finally wrote a book. My mother was so excited. Uh, she's been gone now for almost a year, but she was so excited when I actually wrote a book. Why? Now I understand what you've been doing. Your sister produces television. She understands my being in the theater. She never understood what I was doing. Why are you getting on a plane and going to Houston and working, you know, some car wreck case? Well, because, Mama, those people need me. Oh, people need you. People need you. But she really got it with this. So, um, this is the first book of on Witness Prep. And they, and they asked me to write it. So there you go. So a lot of what we'll be talking about today are techniques that are in the book or their techniques we're using now that have grown up out of, out of the practice that we've been, that active communication has been doing literally for decades. So here's a, here's a scary one. Whether you prepare a witness virtually or in person, what's the most important thing that you have to do to make them a star witness? You have to stop lecturing, like what I'm doing right now. Lecturing is about you. Harvesting is about them. And I know that sounds simple, and I know it sounds stupid, but truly, truly, you know you have a magic list. I call it a magic list. You know how you sit the client down and you go, let me tell you, you're going to have your deposition taken on Friday. And you're going to do this, and don't do this, and do this, and do that, and don't do this, and don't do that, and don't do that. I beg you, since what that does is it puts them off, and, they're, and they want so desperately to please you that they'll go, yeah, I get that, in the way with, that Alan and I talk when we're talking to our accountant over the phone. And truly within three seconds, we don't understand what he's saying. And I'll say to Alan, and Alan will say to me, back and forth like that, um, that's what's going on with your witnesses, except it's not that our money isn't important to us. But the people you deal with, the families that you carry on your shoulders every day of your lives, and you do, you carry families on your shoulders, um, this is such a big deal. This is so important. And they want to please you so much that they'll just go, OK, I can do it. I can do it. And if you notice, some of them can. And you know what? Some of them can't. So there's, I think there's two parts to this for me. One, it's the fundamental thing that's going on in your mind when you go into prep. Because most of the time is, it's what do I need this witness to do? What do I need to control about this witness so that things don't go off the rails? Flip it around. It's what does this person need from me in order to succeed? So when Catherine talks about the magic list, what I love about magic lists is, well, only answer the question asked, and if this and if that. And over your career, as things go wrong, you take that thing and you put it on your magic list. And so your magic list ends up with things like, if opposing counsel comes in not wearing shoes and insisting you call him Captain Fuzzy Pants, <laughs> dot, 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 this is how to handle it. It's like, you know, that happened to you. Probably not going to happen again. Um, you know, you've prepared. And so it's this idea that um, if you've got a list of 50 things, you know, this witness is probably going to take care of 30 of those things naturally because it's just within their personality. Let's get into a dialogue, and as the things that they're going to struggle with come up, then we'll deploy a tool. And you can take that beautiful magic list, because I bet you have one, even if you only have it in your heart. And you could put it off to the side, and at the very end of your witness preparation session, you can go, oh, I just want to do just a little spot check to make sure we got everything. Oh, do you know how many times I have to tell people to think first and speak second? You already do that. You are so amazing. So you're reinforcing what they do. And if you haven't covered something, you can talk about it or do a role play about it. It's kind of a beautiful thing. 
So what does this witness need? For us, it's all about what does this person in front of me need? What does she need? What does he need? Um, this is one of the saddest things I think I ever read on the internet. What do they need from you? Protection and trust. They need to trust you and they need to feel protected by you. And that is hard when what you're thinking is, has the statute run on that? Has the statute run on that? You've got a lot of things you are balancing, but you need to be aware that that's what they need from you. What is real listening? What is real listening? It's so hard, isn't it, to be a lawyer? I'm sorry, it's just hard. This is really hard when you're thinking, has the statute run on this? When you're thinking, oh, but I need the details of the wreck. Oh, look at how time is flying by and do we really have enough time to indulge ourselves in? It's hard to really listen to another human being. And, and I'll add, you know, one of the things that, that's really struck me about TLU is the roster of like rock stars. And we're blessed to work with probably 80% of them. Um, some of them that we've been with since the beginning. What separates the people in the big room from the people who are you know, struggling to win their case is the people at the top are outstanding listeners. I can tell you Keith Mitnick's ability to be quiet and take stuff in and process and not come back with an instruction but come back with a question, that's what makes him who he is. That, when you work with them, you're like, I'm in the presence of a rock star right now because I'm watching how they listen. And it's true for, it's really true across the run of, of the rock stars. Yeah, and you guys have this capability, but it's so hard. It's hard. I, one of my favorite um, moments at when we won a case, won a case in Texas. I believe it was an A&I case. Arne Lindigan. And uh, afterwards, the jurors, the jurors said, oh, we liked you. They talk like this, right? Uh, we liked you all immediately. We liked, we liked your side immediately. We, we hated that guy. We hated him and war guy, the guy from the other side. Because you know like when you're at a party and you're talking to somebody and they just are looking at you like they're waiting for your lips to stop moving so they can talk about themselves? He was like that from the beginning. Now, you may be giving that off and not even realize it, because you're in the, has the statute run on that? Has the statute run on that, right? You can't, it's hard to be open up and just to purely listen, but that's what's necessary. So we have a first question that we ask pretty much every time at the beginning, and it helps us all focus on them versus ourselves. This is it, it's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. The and this, let me tell you, I'm going to tell you now and I'll tell you later, there's two slides, there's two moments that if yep. you walk away with nothing, the absolute most important things you can take away. I haven't done a whip prep in 10 years that has not included this. And I can't see myself do it in the next 10 years. It begins with what questions or concerns do you have with uh, having your deposition taken? or yeah. testifying at trial. I had one exception and made the rule. I'm walking in the room and this woman goes, I know why you're here. I said, really, why am I here? She said, you're here to make me a better witness. I said, really, how am I gonna do that? She said, well, the first thing you're gonna do, da 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 da, and I said, absolutely. What's the second thing I'm gonna do? I mean, I, I didn't know what she was gonna say next, but I, I knew what she needed me to do, so I did all those things. I did a few more things too, but we definitely covered her list. It was, it was like really amazing, Andrew. Um, and you only answer that question. This is the hard part about being a lawyer, right? They say w that one thing, and you know how you wanna go, okay, this is my excuse to talk. Just answer that one thing. So and they, then say, what else? There's, uh, I'm going really to give you guys a reference to something that I didn't put in this PowerPoint because uh, we're already behind. Um, <laughs> uh, there's uh, an internet video you can watch. I encourage you to Google it. Uh, it's called, It's Not About the Nail. Uh, it's not, yeah, I got a nod. All right. You'll understand wh what I'm talking about once you go take a look at it. But the idea here is fixing it is not as important as hearing it and acknowledging it because once you, they get it out loud, they're probably halfway to fixing it themselves and then they own it 
and then they own it. So your impulse as, as a lawyer to solve all the problems, <laughs> right, that hurts you in witness prep. Okay, so I gotta go to the gym. This is killing I don't me. know. I don't know, Jose. Are we back? Oh yeah, harvesting stories. So we're gonna move quickly into where the real damages are. This is my obviously my hand-drawn thing that I used in a witness preparation session once. So they think, meaning the defense thinks, it's just all on the top. But the iceberg we know are the stories, the human stories. That's where the damages are. That's where the real damages are. That's how we maximize human damages, by getting to what the real stories are that are like killer. So this is my favorite all-time um, quote by, uh, by Albert Einstein. Um, Most people stop looking when they find the proverbial needle in the haystack. I would continue looking to see if there were other needles. He said, I'm not a genius, I just don't stop looking. Lawyers sometimes will say to me, well, I only need one story, so I get a story and that's it. I need, I need three good stories. I need three good stories. That's, that one's no good. That was, my that was one of my favorites. Yeah, someone pours oh out God. like, you know, this horrible thing that they struggle with. Everything. Yeah, I don't think the jury's gonna like that. What else you got? To a witness, right? So it's how many stories, because underneath the stories that you have, there's a better story or a more complete story or a story that really hooks in uh, that, that you completely can use and need, but you need to find it. That's why the book's called Harvesting Witnesses Stories, and that's what we think of it as you're harvesting, you're harvesting stories. So here are some phrases that I encourage you to use. They're a bit in the book, but um, instead of talking at them or even insisting on complete questions that are grammatically perfect in English so that you could get an A on the test in the seventh grade, and you know what, you already got in a good school, so I got good news for you. You don't need to do that again unless you're helping someone with homework, right? Um, this, uh, Andrew tells me, and I, I didn't realize this, that the most common one I use is this. Wow. It's... I say wow, and I stop talking, and then they talk some more. We want them to talk some more. What is I... this? Uh-huh. Here's, here's one that's not on there that's, I think, the most powerful one. When they say something, and you're mm. like, oh, there's, I, that's a powerful thing that they just said, or I think there's something more underneath that. Repeat back what they said with a rising inflection. Okay, so it's like, I feel like I'm just not worth the damn thing anymore. You're not worth the damn thing anymore. And then let it hang. Because now I can't satisfy my wife. I can't do anything in the yard. I can't, everything is gonna start flowing simply from, you can, you're not worth anything. Tell me about that. How can you say that? What do you mean, not worth a damn thing? Damn thing like, right? So, how does that make you feel? So, and a big one is how does that make you feel? And we implant, by the way, and you guys deal with people with traumatic brain injuries all the time. That's what, that's what happens when, you, when a human being is smashed in a car. Um, oftentimes the biggest part is here. Sometimes the biggest, which I always think of as the top part of the spine. Uh, sometimes we're in wheelchairs. Sometimes our brains have been rattled around. Um, how does that make you feel is huge because we want them associating their emotional feelings with their injuries, right? Because that's what it's all about. So for example, then in a, in a case um, that then you take to trial and you say, you're going along in direct examination and you say, um, and he says, yeah, because he's sitting in a wheelchair and you've chosen to examine him by sitting down across from him. Um, and uh, he says, yeah, you know, I never get to be, feel like this, like I'm just equal with somebody. Wow. How does that make you feel? In a TBI case, you see their little eyeballs cross, and you can tell that they don't, 
um, that they don't remember what the heck you even said or where they are. You get to say, are you OK? Yeah, I just got lost. Ah, does that happen to you a lot now? Yeah. How does that make you feel? And you're in real time, instead of going, well, my next question is very important, as I've gotten it stacked up perfectly in my direct, being willing to abandon and to see what's really in front of you. Cole Porter, Night and Day, my favorite tune. And that's when the jurors go, oh, because we've all had the experience together. We've watched it happen. You think the other team is going to say, oh, is there something wrong with you? When he goes, I just got lost. Oh, well, whatever. You so know, not going to happen. That kind of, it, this is sort of an aside. You know, we've only got so much time. And with the time we got, we wanted to give you some solid techniques. And we're going to get into that. For those of you who do a lot of traumatic brain injury, grab us after this is over. Because one of the most important things to know is that prepping a traumatic brain injury witness is a fundamentally different set of, of techniques and a fundamentally different set of goals, all right? And an awareness of what they're going through. And, and by the way, I'd add while we're talking TBI, half the TBI cases I work on were not a TBI when they called me in to do the prep. It's midway through the prep, I'm trying to work with something, and I'm seeing things, I'm saying, do we have a, do we have a problem, DTI yeah. on this? Do we have contrast imaging? I think you need to get in there soon. Um, you're doing a different thing, because you can't, you can't expect to train someone who is incapable of remembering the training. You can't expect someone to speak freely and open and listen and engage. But, but Andrew, this part, he's got to say this he's part about the wreck. He's got to say this part about the wreck. He but my dear, he doesn't remember. And that's why we have, you know, I mean, it's yeah. very, life so, is tough. Oh, go ahead, please. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'll get it for I'm fine. I'm the, fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. I'm just great. I'm fine. So, I'm fine. so, uh, so yes. It's, that's, tr that's not so much a TBI, uh, and it's true on TBIs. That's a problem across the spectrum, and I think it's a, a you core You found this in everything. Point. That's okay. Okay, so my leg is missing from the what, wreck. I'm fine. What do, I what just, do I can use oil? the other one. I'm really good at that. Yeah, um, uh, what about the person in a TBI case who, who just says they're fine, right? And in all cases, who it's, say, it's I'm fine. It's across all cases. I, what do oil rig workers have in common with moms, right? No matter what the hell happens to them, they're always fine. <laughs> they got this. I, the way I say it when I'm connecting with a witness uh, is, you know, one of the things I've learned about moms is uh, mom always eats last. And uh, I, I have a feeling that that part of you is the part of you that's talking to me about what you're going through and what it's like to struggle to find words. Are you, I mean, just you and me, are you struggling to find words sometimes? And then it goes. Yeah, there's also, I call this whole area, especially with brain, I call it passing which is a, a word that came up in Reconstruction in America because, you know, slavery was not only bad, but we had to make it even worse after it was over. But people uh, needed to pretend physically that they, weren't, that they weren't black, that they were white. That was a whole thing that happened. And um, uh, it, it happened so much that, by the way, I am 3% black and without DNA testing would never have known it. Right? Because it's not like anyone said, well, at the beginning of the 19th century, by the way, did you know in Jamaica, and there were the. Um, but uh, I call it passing because a lot of our people are trying to pass as normal people. They're trying to pass as regular people. And to, um, Alan would say to me when I'd come home, he'd say, What's the hardest thing you do? I say, Take somebody's manhood away from him on a daily basis. Um, they're trying to pass as people with brains. They have the, the, the higher the IQ used to be before they got whacked, it's still in there somewhere, but the more likely they are to have figured out a whole system of how to not, how to still be the regional sales manager. I, I walked with, worked with this one guy. It was a 
it was an auto wreck. And he, um, he was the regional sales manager for paper for the entire, you know. And he, um, he would go to the people, and he knew that they were his old customers because he had, the, he had it still written down. And he would go, he would go and he, he would say, <clears throat> so, I know that, I, you know I know what you ordered last year. But it doesn't matter what you ordered last year. You tell me right now what you want to order this year. We're just like, well, oh my God. So he was just trying to be. And pass, there's, pass. there's a passing thing that happens where they don't, and we're just off the rails on TBI. So if you guys want us to get back on the rails, let me know. But, but it's with the, everything. The, on, on a TBI, um, a lot of the times what looks like a curable problem, like rambling, well, this person doesn't have trouble finding words. I can't get them to shut up. Well, here's what's happening. You're asking a question. They can't find the words and they can't follow the thought. So they start on the topic of the question you ask and then they just start talking about something else so that you won't catch them not knowing what's going on because that's a skill they've perfected to keep from getting fired. To keep So all of these skills that they've perfected to trick the world into thinking that they're not broken yeah. are now being used in a way that will trick opposing counsel into thinking there's no damages. And so you've got to, that's why with a TBI, you can't do the prep, you know, a month before. We got to start as far out as possible really? and we've got to start giving them exercises that will condition them in their day-to-day -day life to acknowledge the emergence yeah. of w that symptom. Yeah, it's the same with the physical injuries. By the way, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about guardrail cases. I don't know. So your you, your your guy is in a car and goes into guardrail um, and gets their leg amputated because guardrails work in reverse sometimes, um, and they always assume that it's their fault because they woke up. You know, you fell asleep. Well, you know, no, waking up. So that in, has to do with brain injury. But I find when I work with those, those young guys, it's mostly young guys, you say, um, what's the hardest thing? What's the hardest thing about being an amputee? What's the hardest thing? And do you know what they say? And they, get, and they start crying. They say, when a pr complete stranger comes up to me and says, thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. Because people assume that amputees have been fighting for our country somewhere. They don't assume that they are fighting for our country. They happen to be fighting in a court of law right now to make things better and change things. Uh, they are in a kind of war. Um, All right. Okay. So let's talk let's a little bit. How are we in. doing? How are we doing? Anybody got any more questions, comments, criticism, abuse before we, we do some like? Let's get some process going. Let's get what some do you process say? going here. What the heck? So. Here are tools that will undoubtedly help you as they help us. So mo every human being you meet, except if there's a problem of blindness or, so, or they have a problem with hearing or they're Helen Keller, um, they're either primarily visual, primarily auditory, primarily kinesthetic. By that I mean they do all those things. We all do all those things, but where do they do them first? Where do they come to into it first? It's helpful to know where do you come into it first? Because wherever you come into it first, those are the words you will use, probably. Like I'm primarily visual, so I will say, you see this, you see that? If I'm dealing with somebody who primarily is, is hearing or listening, you know what? Your witness feels like they already screwed up because the first thing they did wasn't When see. When you got to the hospital after the crash, um, tell me what are the first things you saw? Uh, yep. You know, Here, tell I'll me. I'll go right to that. There we go. So this is, where is my <coughs> former police officer? Did you come back, young man? Okay, so um, it, it, this is interesting. This is neuro-linguistic programming. So when you watch their eyeballs, they give it away. You say, uh, what questions or concerns you have about having your deposition taken? They think, um, seeing people think up. That's what we do. Hearing people go from side to side. You might notice that that um, auditory lawyers 
hate visual witnesses because they look up, they go, make her stop looking up. And I say, well, sweetheart, we don't want her to stop looking up because that's like actually part of how she thinks. We'd like her to think before she talks. And, um, and primarily visual people will say of auditory witnesses, they'll say, shifty eyed, those eyeballs are going back and forth. How can anyone trust her? And go, got to process, baby. We got to let those people do what they do so, naturally. So here's how I suggest people were try to take this chart home because you're probably going to forget. You know, somebody was taking a picture of it. You're going to try and memorize it. You're probably not going to memorize it. Here's the cheat. Yeah. If they're looking up, they're going up into their brain to look at the answer. If they're going side to side, they're looking for the answer in, in their ears. And the downs are a, a bit more, uh, they're a bit more of a rarity. If you can only walk away with one tidbit. And another thing that's really important, um, there's been some there's been a thing of uh, microexpression and criminal interrogation folks who are coming into the trial consulting space, and I think it's great anytime we have new ideas. There is a beef that we have, though, with that approach in that the, the difference between a constructed image and a remembered image. Sometimes the image that they're constructing is not a lie. It's an attempt to try and construct something to make you happy. They're trying to give you what you want, which is very different. It's different to have a client who's a liar than a client who's a pleaser. So when you're getting some of those uh, behaviors, those eye movements that make you think, oh, well, that's a lie. The I cops movement. would no. say this is a liar. No. Yeah, that, that's so vital, so vital. And you can say, um, do you remember? It's, o it's OK if you don't remember. Are you sure? because you seem to really want me to remember. It's really OK. I don't remember is actually an OK answer. We have a slide on that later. Um, so why is it so important? And, and this, I'm just going to show you the images that Andrew's talking about. Because you have to speak their language, or they, you're going to lose them at the worst possible moment. They need to trust you, OK? So what's the first thing you remember blanking when you walked into the ho uh, hospital room? How do you talk to a visual person? What's the first thing you remember seeing when you went in that hospital room after the wreck? Seeing, that's what they remember. I said hearing, I gave an image of those machines, because often it's the first thing they remember is ba-boop, ba-boop, ba-boop. Uh, that's what they remember. Um, how do you talk to a kinesthetic person? What's the first thing that you felt? Sometimes it'll be the touch of the skin. Sometimes it's, it was so cold in there. And mama doesn't like to be cold. And it was so cold, I couldn't believe it. And I'll, I'll tell you, keeping your eyes out for kinesthetic people is your best case sensory expressions for a jury come from the kinesthetics. I had a case not too long ago that involved a woman, woman's child dying in her arms by the side of the road, age seven. And she was kinesthetic. She couldn't tell me, she couldn't remember what she saw. She didn't even remember hearing the sirens. But the description of breath going out and body cold setting in, it's kinesthetic people have the most astounding sensory descriptions for the purposes of a jury. Yeah. Damage as much? I think so. So. Again, don't take the risk of not honoring the first thing they remember by insisting they remember the first thing you would remember. It's so hard being a lawyer, isn't it? It's so hard. Um, and again, how do I get the information quickly? Ask the question, listen to the answer. What questions or concerns do you have? Their eyeballs will give it away. Their eyeballs will give it away. Watch the eyeballs, Mona Lisa. So learning, how are we doing, Andrew? Oh, well, here we go. I'll just turn this off, actually. The language they use when they talk to you will give away some of how they process. People say, I see, I see what you mean. Oh, well, I hear what you say. That feels right to me. Those are not arbitrarily chosen words. Those words are the, how they express, how they process, without them even realizing that that's what they're doing. So, to write on what Alan is saying, can you describe the hospital room for me? 